Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Mark Beecher, the president of the National Association of Rudimental Drummers, voting member of the Grammys, creator of the DVD Art of Ancient Rudimental Drumming, a performer with many great artists, teacher at Drexel University. Mark, you're quite the, uh, you have quite the resume. How are you? Oh, good. Thank you so much for, uh, thank God, with this uh, coronavirus going around. I'm just <laughs> yeah. glad, glad to be uh, vertical, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm really, in a, thanks to all the medical professionals and first responders out there. Uh, just Absolutely. Wanna, just uh, thanks to them. Yeah, but, no, that's uh, very true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're uh, we're recording this obviously both at our different houses and stuff like that. So um, I'm just grateful that you could, you know, I think it's a good time now that I, that we do have time to do yeah. things like this yeah, and talk really. to each other. No, and thank yeah. you, thank you for the invite. Absolutely, and I, and I'll say real quick um, that that uh, Brandon Faulkner was the man who connected us uh, and got us got this set up, and I just love that when people say, "Hey, you guys should talk," and, and here we are. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Brandon. Appreciate it. Cool. So uh, today's topic is basically the history of rudimental drumming, um, which is a pretty broad topic. There's tons of stuff to cover. So why don't we jump right in and you can take it back as far as you can go with the history of of rudiments and rudimental drumming. Yeah, well, uh, Bart, it goes back... uh, Back to the pretty much to the to the Middle Ages. That's where that's where you get where you see it coming in uh, uh, in the uh, and, and was this as drumming and, and in the history of percussion um, and, and drums. I mean, there's always been a connection between drumming and dance. Yeah, um, and sure. uh, yeah, and it started out obviously with. Uh, not only with dance and entertainment in cultures, but also in the military for communications. Yeah. So, so before they had iPhones and walkie talkies and <laughs> radios, uh, the drum was the uh, drum and fife were the two things that were used for communications and, and sending signals uh, across a, a far distance, across fields of battle. Hmm. And the drums, especially now, the fifes are very high register, so you could hear them. But the drums, uh, even more so, uh, were used um, for for communicating and sending signals. So not only in the military, but also in in, in very a lot of uh, indigenous cultures, the drum was used for communicating. But uh, gotcha. yeah, so we see some of the first notations for. Drum, uh, what we would call maybe rudiments. Uh, one of the, the earliest documented forms is uh, in this book called Orchestography hmm. by, by this Frenchman, uh, Toineau Arbeau. And uh, he wrote this book, uh, Orchestography. And he has, um, he has this notation, this primitive drum notation. Now, up to that point, there really wasn't much drum notation at all because well first of all people didn't think drummers were musicians <laughs> yeah <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> yeah true <laughs> and probably in some bands we we still get that right <laughs> yeah, all the drummer jokes and all yeah, that stuff. exactly yeah. exactly yeah but uh but yeah so it took a while it took all those years i mean now now we're, we have recorded um Human history goes back uh, five thousand years, pretty much um, recorded human history. So it was only uh, uh, up until uh, the fifteen hundreds, the sixteenth century, that we start to see this drum notation. So this book by Tuano Arbo, this Frenchman, uh, it, it's the book is written in a in a a dialogue between a teacher and a student, and in this book. He's talking about dance and and the different aspects of of dance with uh, in their in their culture in France, and and he mentions about how the drum was used for uh, for to help with the dance, hmm. and, and as we we know, we, we, it's kind of embedded the the feeling of 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 the rhythm. We have our heartbeat, sure. So yeah, that's kind of where we. It's kind of an, an Rhythm is inbred in us, in everyone. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, we certainly see children are very percussive at an early age. We, we see them, they like to take their hands and strike things. And sometimes we'll yes. see children at a very early age, like we did with Buddy Rich, where he, they just had this, at 18 months, he's a part of his parents' vaudeville act. I mean, he was just a total <laughs> child prodigy. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, but but we do see young children with that ability uh, to, because we have that that sense of, I mean, the arts is, is a God-given uh, a thing that, uh, that, that all humans are given to. We, we can sing. We have the voice. And, I mean, the earliest instruments are the voice and percussion. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard it referred to as the the uh, I believe it was in an earlier episode with Angela Sells. It was it was talking about how it was the mother drum, and it's it reminds you of your mother's heartbeat. Exactly, and yeah, and it's so true. I mean, it's yeah, it's nature. Exactly. I mean, you've heard that. Yeah, uh, you know, may, maybe uh, unconsciously we we've that was that that heartbeat of our mother's was in our brains, and subconsciously maybe we've that's part of the whole rhythm. The rhythmic process that that we that happens. So mm. so yeah. yeah. So this Twano Arbo uh, documented this. Um, documented now, before this. him, was it was it maybe passed down? Yeah, it was like all by orally. Yeah, like it was all by rote. Yeah, it was all by rote. Yeah, gotcha, right. gotcha. Um, okay. So and, and he he also would notated with. Uh, with words underneath the notes. So, okay. yeah, so you could kind of figure out how a rhythm would, would go. For example, he had, uh, like, well, one example of rhythm would be tan, tan, terry, tan. Huh, okay. Tan, 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 terry, tan. The terry would be, like, yeah, 16th notes or 8th notes, depending how fast you're saying gotcha. it. Yeah, which we still kind of do today with exactly. like Pat Boone, Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so for Arbo, he was writing tan, 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 Terry, tan, Terry as the sixteenth notes, and uh, or okay. eighth notes, and and tan, tan as quarter notes or or eighth notes. Cool. So yeah, and then there, um, and also with I'm uh, not too f- uh, moving ahead a. a a, f- a few years later, um, in Italy, there was a uh, another gentleman, uh, Bonaventura Pistolfolo, and in 1627 he re- he released a book uh, by the name of uh, entitled Il Tornio, hmm. and it had pretty much the same notation. Now, uh, Arbo was using a uh, a five line staff, like we see today, but Mm-hmm. The notes were all on one line. So, uh, in, um, in, in drum, in modern notation, most of the snare drum notation is on the, the C line of, of yeah. the staff. Sure. Well, this was pretty much, we find that pretty much on the same, uh, on the same line. So, uh, so you'll see it on the B line. And, uh, now, um, Pasofalo, he had his notation on the A, on the A line. And then, uh, so, hmm. so for those first, uh, let's say the first, um, like say the first hundred years, we're seeing the, the, the drum notation all on one line with the, with the words underneath to f- figuring out what the, what, like what hand is being played. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I guess yeah. everyone in the world is basically learning. It's just starting. So exactly. Kind of exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah so for, if you say, like we were saying for all those thousands of years, um, nobody was notating drum music. Yeah, so you had uh, for so for Arbo, you had Tan, Terry, and Frey. Now Frey was supposed to be uh, four quavers, four taps of the stick. So the other notation was the the Frey, yeah. the word Frey, F R E. That um, that was for four taps of the stick. Okay. So t- Tan was one tap, Terry two, and then Frey was like a roll, say four or, or a roll. Gotcha. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then uh um in uh 
El Tornio in, in Costafalo's book, uh, he has tapa, 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 like T-A and then P-A, tapa, tapa, for his, uh, for his notation. Now, let me ask you this. So these guys are putting this all together and maybe we take a sidebar and I can ask you what is, so, so what I'm getting at is when did the actual, are these considered rudiments at this point? And, and then on top of that, can you maybe give, so everyone is on the same page of all levels of learning. Mm -hmm. What is the definition of a rudiment? Okay. Well, that, that term actually came in, uh, with uh, Charles Stewart Ashworth, who was the he was the drum major of the United States Marine Corps Band, so he came out with his new useful and complete system of drum beating at 1812. We've heard of the War of 1812, where yeah. So Charles Stewart Ashworth was the uh, he was the drum major for the Marine Corps Band, and he released this uh, this this manual. Uh, with drum rudiments, and that was where we first see the term rudiments. Gotcha. That's good to know. So then going back to what I was saying before about, so these guys are basically documenting, I would guess I would call them early rudiments, or like different rhythms and patterns, right, right? in Italy right. and in France. Okay. Right, so. right, right. So we have, we have strokes, you know, differentiating between the right hand and the left hand. Sure. And then... And then later, as, as time moved forward, uh, we start to see uh, in the 1700s, so we, we, went, we go from the 1500s into the 1600s, we're pretty much with the same notation. And, and, uh, and, and what one popular method uh, or, or of differentiation between the right hand and the left hand was, uh, was poo too. Hmm. The right hand was poo, the left hand was too. So, and, and Pooh was in P-O-U. Okay. P-O-U. Okay. Man, they really, I didn't realize how prevalent it was to like verbalize. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. So, well, and I think that comes off of the fact that um, because everything was up to that point was by rote. Yeah. They're vocalizing a lot of these rhythms. So they finally wrote them down. And when one person wrote them down, then they just kind of followed suit with with the notation sure. right that makes perfect sense yeah so cool. yeah so uh so with the left hand being poo and the um and the right hand being two you see that notation uh, uh there are a few uh, early drum manuals in the 1700s by um by some revolutionary war drummers so they were and these are some of the earliest uh, drum manuals that we have actually by Revolutionary War soldiers. So we can see the rudiments that they were using. And we uh, you, uh, these copies are available. You can go to uh, two of them are in the Massachusetts Historical Society. So you can go check them out. Uh, some, a few of them are available online. You can see bits and pieces of them. Um, and a friend, of, a friend of mine, um, Pfeiffer friend, Ed, Edmund Boyle, who lives about 10 minutes from me in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. He, um, he not only sells my drum video, but he sells all the, pretty much all the manuals, early drum manuals that you could ever want. So cool. if you go to beapfeiffer.com, like B-A, uh, B-E-A-F-I, you know, B-E-A-F-I-F-E-R, beapfeiffer.com, cool. you can pick up these, these manuals. And it's pretty incredible to see the actual photocopies of these actual manuals from this from the the 18 1700s 1800s and you can see the progression of the rudiments yeah so that's fascinating so then they would write them out obviously you know they would notate things with a you know ink and a quill exactly and then, exactly and then copy it right with like a printing press i'm probably saying that. Right, right. whatever they well, or, yeah. the, or the slabs or whatever well, they would well, use and this and these uh uh, these early, these Rev War uh, drummers, they were actually diaries. So they're, it's their handwritten diaries that they never reproduced. So oh, it's, ju it's just for them. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, wow. yeah, they, but they documented. And I mean, here we are reading it. I'm looking at this this photocopy of this one by Benjamin Clark. He was a, a drummer from the Rev War. And 
I'm looking at his rules for the drum, and he has the long roll, the 10, the nine stroke roll, seven, five, three, the double drag, single drag, the roughs. Wow. So there he has a list of the rudiments um, that he felt were the important ones. He also has uh, flamadiddle. Uh, he has the paradiddle. Um, really? Yeah. Nice. Right. So, you know, you're seeing some of the rudiments we're still playing today, but you're seeing it written in, in um, with, uh, you know, the, the right hand on top and the left hand on bottom or sometimes reversed. Yeah. Um, wow. But that's before um, the actual, like you said, 1812 was when the root, like that's exactly that, right. before it was formalized. Exactly. Okay, so yeah. Yeah. like many things with drumming, it seems like it was like, it was just like jazz almost where it's pulled from a thousand different places into one, you know, it, it becomes one thing later on, but it seems like this has just been building for hundreds of years. Exactly. And Interesting. yeah. So, um, yeah. So like in the, uh, this, uh, Charles Stewart Ashworth in his manual, the left hand is on the top and the right is on the bottom. And he hmm. and he was got like his influence was uh, he he was looking at some of the material. Now a lot of this came from well the first um, some of the the first real uh, the the drummers that were some of the the the, the more well trained drummers that uh, um, you, you found in Switzerland, and they were the Swiss drummers were the mercenaries, so they were part of you, you've heard of this uh, the Swiss Army and. Well, the, the Swiss mercenaries were hired by other countries to fight. Napoleon hired the, the Swiss mercenaries. And so these mercenaries, these Swiss drummers were traveling all around the world uh, fighting for these other countries. And even as they were uh, in, in their travels, they were picking up things as well, other military drum beatings. But, uh, but they were especially like the, the Swiss mercenaries were pretty fierce fighters. Of course, now it's a neutral country, but they still have. I, I, I didn't know that, so yeah, I want to yeah. like go into this even further because when you said Swiss Army, I'm like, I I don't know anything about. It. I know Swiss Army knives, obviously, right, but, right, right. But so you're saying they're mer like the drummers are mercenaries who are fighters, or are there a group of mercenaries who also have drummers in their group who are you know the guys yeah. who? Well, yeah, the the drummers were the and the fifers were the ones giving the signals. Yeah, sure. So, of course. So without the without the drummers and fifers, like they wouldn't be able to do, they wouldn't be able to march and, and step, and they wouldn't be able to hear their signals across the field. Wow. So like you said, like Napoleon would say, we need more fighters. Exactly. Or, let's call the Swiss Army. Let's call yeah. Let's call the Swiss Army to come help us out. And and it, actually in America, we George Washington did the same thing. He brought over General Lafayette from France. Yeah. And also General uh, von Steuben from he was a Prussian German Prussian soldier. Oh, so man. wow, yeah. So uh, and especially von Steuben, he wrote a manual for the for the troops, and uh, mentioned the importance of the of the the rudiments or the drum the the drum signals. Hmm. And now uh, you were saying this before, and just to, to make sure I fully understand, so I. I in my limited knowledge of this before we were talking, I've always heard that I've equated rudiments with Switzerland. Yes. And and I don't know why. I think I know why now because of what you just said of these guys traveling all over and gaining this knowledge from all these different, you know, places exactly. they fought. That's fascinating. Exactly. And people were, uh, and, and some of the, the militaries from the other countries, they would pick up stuff from the Swiss drummers and vice yeah. versa. And so you'll see a similarity in French drums, French rudiments and Swiss rudiments. There are a lot of mm. uh, similarities. Sure. Yeah. Um, wow. Cool. That's yeah. unbelievable. I had no idea. Yeah. And well, of course, I don't know if you've, if you're familiar with one of the rudiments that that's you can use on the drum set on drum kit. Uh, you know, I, I still call it a drum set. I mean, the original term was trap set. Oh yeah, but I think uh, drum set, drum kit, yeah. tubs, whatever the hell you want to call it, is funny. right. Right. I, I think the kit kind of came out of the the British invasion, 
We yeah. everybody called it the drum set before the Beatles came over, and then they heard Ringo calling it the drum kit. Now, well, it's cool to call it a drum kit. So, but before <laughs> yeah. that, everybody called it a trap set or a drum set. Sure, set of yeah. drums. But you uh, get you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. So we so the rudiments progressing from Europe uh, into uh, over the into the British Isles. And then as the, uh, as the settlers were coming over from Europe, so were all the, the, the culture, the music, and for the military, when the f- military was being formed uh, from the, the colonies, uh, those, the, the, the uh, what you call the American, the American colonies, mm-hmm. they were borrowing uh, their, a lot of their calls from the British. So... They were using a lot of the. They were using the British manuals for their uh, for their education, their instruction. Uh, one of the one of the manuals that was pretty popular at the time was um, for uh, this manual by Sam Potter. This is a British manual, and he was a drum major in the Coldstream Regiment of Foot Guards. So for under <laughs> Charles the Fourth, so. Really? So you have you have uh, Potter's manual coming over, and and for the for the musicians and military people that were coming over from Britain from uh, from the UK, they were they were picking up the the English rudiments, which were some influenced from your other parts of Europe. So you have this uh, you have this melding pot of drum yeah. rudiments, right, from Europe. And, and the UK coming over into America. And uh, so you'll, you'll see a lot of, sim- I mean, some of the, the main similarities are the flam, the, the long roll, the double strip roll or the long roll, if you call it that. Sure. Um, now, this again is probably, I'll ask the stupid questions that maybe someone out there is thinking. Is there, is there ever any, I guess that maybe it wouldn't happen because battlefields are so huge, but if, if there's two countries or groups or regions fighting let's say america versus you know the Re- revolutionary war if mm-hmm. with england are there ever any confusion over the troop like the the different groups of drummers from the each side playing similar patterns is that a dumb question no 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 it's not a dumb question and um they uh well the the, the one thing that that uh, say in the in the American Revolution, the one thing that um, that a lot of people don't know, like I, I've done some, uh, I, I do a lot of work uh, entertaining the the tourists in Philadelphia. And I've done that for many years. Now you know, we haven't done it lately because of the the, the coronavirus. Course, but sure, um, I mean, most of my life I've been entertaining uh, tourists in Philadelphia, and, and you'd be surprised how many people know nothing about their American history. In fact, yeah. in fact, Europeans know more about American history than Americans do. So <laughs> great. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I know it's pretty bad, <laughs> but uh, you know, like I'll have a, a revolutionary war uniform and somebody will say, are you supposed to be Abraham Lincoln? And it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's fine. But, but now we'll be wearing our, are red regimental uniforms. And people say, are you the British? You know, I thought, I, I thought, you know, you're the red coats. Well, the, the American soldiers were wearing, uh, the, the musicians wore red. Now the British also wore red too. Yeah. But the, uh, the Americans, the, 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 uh, the American soldiers troops were wearing that the musicians would wear red with blue, collars and 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 sleeves whereas the british were had uh, uh red with white hmm. so but the red the, the red you could be seen at a far distance so uh now some of the um uh, some of the beatings would be uh, uh a little different they would have some of the same kind of they would have the same uh, uh maybe like say a rough or they would call it rough or drag yeah. Uh like the two two grace notes with the left and the the main stroke with the right either called a rough or a drag. Sure. 
Um, now, they would take that and put it in a different combination than, say, the British. Okay. So they would, they would be, there would be different, uh, they, they would change up the beat so there wouldn't be confusion between okay. the troops. Yeah, because that could be a problem. Yeah, we're, yeah. I could even, I mean, it'd be dirty, but I could even see you using that to your advantage to, like, confuse people. Like, some espionage type. Oh, exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, interesting. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there was, uh, you know, so you do have, a, they were using the same rudiments. You know, they sure. were using, though they're all using long rolls, the double circ roll. Yeah. But, but you would have to change it up as to not confuse your troops with the other ones. So, yeah. But yeah. then, like I said, but then the other thing to, to decide whether it was, hey, are they from our side or not, were their, were their uniforms. So, mm. And, and the reason okay. why they, the, again, the, 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 diff, the, the different colors or the red, the red uniforms for the musicians, so they could be seen through the battle. It was easier for them to be seen at a, at a greater distance. Sure. So. To know that, okay, pay attention to this guy. He's going to tell us what's going on. And it, also, they probably wouldn't go out of their way to go and start killing musicians. even. Well, believe it or not, they would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. Uh, in fact, that was a problem, like even in the Civil War, you know, kill the messenger. Because if, if you don't want, we don't want the, we don't want them to send oh. the signal. So kill the drummer sure. first. Sure. You know? Wow. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of these young boys uh, are, are joining the, the, the army, you know, at 12 years old mm. and sometimes even younger. I mean, they, they would sneak in. They wanted to join. They thought it was cool to join. Someone would sneak in earlier. Uh, and then, but you know, you have really young young boys, and they're just thrown into learning an instrument. And not all the the technique was was that good. And, um, it was something that George Washington complained about von Steuben. So they they were on a campaign to improve the the musicianship so that the beatings were more accurate. So really? you're bringing people in that aren't musicians and just giving them, handing them a drum and say, okay, play this, you know, <laughs> that so, almost speaks to the, like the nature of people thinking, oh, it's just a drum. Just exactly. Give them the drum. Exactly, exactly. Wow. Exactly. That's crazy. George Washington commented on. Oh, are you kidding? You know? oh, oh, the drummer was really, he, I mean, he made, he would put out orders to bring drummers for at like, one point they needed a drummer and he put out a, an order to bring this drummer from uh from one town to to where they were stationed so otherwise they were they were they're sunk without the signals yeah, so without yeah. the drummer the drummer was really important i mean this is a really important part of world history i mean uh, people don't realize it but even for the the lay person the average person i don't, that don't i mean not only do they not know our, their own history but most people, even a lot of historians, don't realize the importance of drummers, especially in the military in our world history, not only for culture, but for their survival of, yeah. of, our, of our country. The drummer Absolutely. was really important. And, and for, in order for them to, in order for the, the, the armies to survive and to win the battles, the drummer was really important. Yeah. So he he had to know all these signals. Mm, he had to man. learn them, and uh, wow. you know, I mean, there was like there's a, 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 the troop, there's the march, there's the preparative, there's the the retreat, there's a church call, there's a uh, the ch they call it the roast beef, their dinner call. <laughs> so they have all these calls that the drummer, and then, um, yeah, you know, you have all these and and. The troops are relying on these calls to one to go to bed, reveille. Mm. Um, three camps was was reveille used to wake up the troops. And a lot of people don't know that taps. You know, you, you hear um, the the term taps at, at yeah. funerals. Well, that w really was the drummer that was oh. the, the the one who originally played the taps for lights out, and uh, it came from. Uh, the tap, the, the it was shorts. Uh, what some people say it was short for tap toe. 
the, the word tap toe or tap two. And what that was, was that was the signal for the bars to put the taps up. So, Man. yeah. So That's crazy. It is crazy. That. It is crazy. So the drummer is giving the signal for everybody to go to sleep. And if they didn't put their lights out, I mean, they could be actually, they could be shot or hanged for not obeying the orders of turning the lights out at night. So that's a, that's an appropriate reaction. Um, yeah. I, well, <laughs> believe, believe it or not, I was, I was, there's the story of a, of a, of a soldier not putting his lights out. He was writing a letter to his wife and the, the commander came around and said, uh, soldier, why, why aren't your lights out? He said, well, I'm writing a, a note to my wife. He said, well, you can also add that you'll be shot at daylight for not obeying the orders. I mean, they were, the, the, you know, oh. yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's pretty brutal. Yeah, brutal. Uh, you know, people think, you think of the Revolutionary War being the powder puff, the people wearing wigs, and it wasn't a powder puff. We war is all war is bad, so. Yeah, I think that's a great point of like, almost like, I don't know, movies. You almost think of like, I forget, I think it was the Revolutionary War, but like, like uh, the Patriot with like oh, Mel was, Gibson. Or that something. was a great. That was a great one. You it know? was a great one. But yeah. I just mean you think of these movies, which that actually was a great representation yeah, of the really stuff. Was. But but like even like World War One, the yeah. Civil War, all of these wars are just Every, war is war. Yeah, war. War is war, and all wars are bad. And you know, there's no yeah. war that's worse than any other one. So you know, no. ha- hats off to our service people. Absolutely. But now, uh, um, getting back on track yeah, here a little yes. bit. So, so rudiments were were in Europe, starting in earliest notation was in France, right? Then in 1627 went to Italy, right? Then we got sort of mixed in with the Swiss. Where then it spread around Europe, right? More, right, right, right. Correct. Well, yeah, and the uh, actually, there's there's records of the this what they call the side drum, the earliest actual record of a of a, of its like say a snare drum or drum being used like maybe the first gig it on record was in the 1300s in Basel, Switzerland. Okay. And really the, the, the drummer was the town crier. So the drummer was the one that announced, made all the announcements, you know, hear ye, hear ye. You'd see yeah. in movies with a, somebody uh, shaking the bell. Sure. Well, it was really in, in the earliest, uh, notation that we have of drummer getting paid was he was a part of the the he was a part of this the city he would be being paid by the city to make the announcements the news for the day for the city so Mm -hmm. that was in the 1300s so we have that if you go to basel switzerland you can see the record of the drummer and he was listed as part on the uh on the payroll for working for the city for giving the news of the day God, so the drummers so were the, <laughs> long ago that's yeah, unbelievable I, it, it is unbelievable i mean if you if you think about it you know you're this is uh you know the earliest drummers gig was being a, like a cnn uh a news host yeah <laughs> for, <laughs> that's for the, awesome for the city of basel so again the drummers the the, the importance of the drummer in society, you know, was really, and they're playing, you know, they're playing rudiments. They're, they're playing strokes. And as, as we saw, like you mentioned in our Bose uh, book, we start to see, you know, differentiate between right and left and, and right hand and left hand. And that carried through. Yeah. uh, Italy, then England, uh, this they have this record of this. It was called the English March. They call it. Hmm. So it was there was the voluntary before the march and then the march. So were, there were two parts of it. But uh, uh, Charles the first, King Charles the first, actually put a warrant out for the drummer to play this march. So and, and it has the poo to poo to. You know, it has that underneath yeah. the notes all in the same line. Wow. So yeah, so we go from the the thirteen hundreds to the fifteen hundreds in France and sixteen hundreds in Italy and to England. And, and it then, comes across to the American and colonies. Across the American colonies. And wow. then they then with the, the soldiers being trained, they're learning the rudiments, and then we have these these early manuals. We have um we have the um 
Charles Stewart Ashworth's book. We have uh, even we have one. Um, we we actually have some other manuals from London. Uh, we have one is called The Young Drummer's Assistant by Longman and Broderick. That was 1780. There was a manual uh, called The Academy of Ar Armory by Randall Home. That was in 1688. And it actually mentioned both a rough and a drag. There's been this debate, okay, what's a rough and a drag? Because in the in the 26 rudiment, large rudiment list, um, you'll see the, the two right, two right, uh, or two left grace notes, and then the, the strong uh, right hand or reversed those three notes as a rough, but then now they're calling it a drag. Well, actually, in this um, Academy of Armory by Randall Holm in 1688, he actually mentions it's all he doesn't show notes, but he mentions the rudiments, and he actually mentions a roof R O O F E and a drag D R A G G. So they're both in the same book. Now, now there's. I was in this uh, 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 yeah. this email list for um, a, a debate that was going on. Okay, what's a rough and what's a drag? That this has been going on for probably since since the Nard rudiments were was put together. The, the since the Nard rudiment list was put together, there's been this argument. Well, I've seen in old manuals the, the word drag used for three those three notes. That's interesting. So there's some debate, I guess, of but that's true with a lot of things with the origins of right, something especially right. because well, now, that far. now you're from you're probably familiar with the term the Muller stroke we've heard yes. this yeah okay yes well sanford Muller. i don't know if you know anything about sanford a Muller at all but dom famulara just on came on the uh, show and did a whole episode on Muller, gladstone and stone so yeah, okay okay good let's see right. how much i retained okay when, go ahead and test me all right <laughs> <laughs> all right so Sanford Muller was a famous drummer and teacher. He was also a great drum maker, too. But he also taught Gene Krupa. We all know the name Gene Krupa pretty of much, course. I'm sure. Right. Sing, 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 and played with Benny Goodman, had his own yep. band. Right. Well, at one point, he wanted to learn the rudiments. So he went and he heard about this guy, Sanford Muller, that he's the top rudimental drummer if you want to learn about military drumming and rudiments go to Sanford Muller which he did and the thing about Muller was he at one point he um he had seen the he, he was still alive when the the uh Civil War veterans were still around and um you can actually I show a lot of my students this and other drummers this which is probably hard to believe I mean if you ask somebody Hey, are there any films of Civil War drummers at all, or musicians, or anybody? You'd probably say films of civil people who fought in the Civil War. Uh, no, I don't think so. But actually, if you go on the YouTube, there's a video of Civil War veterans playing fifes and drums. Wow! Okay, I these, find that. these guys are uh, these guys are 90 years old, and they're still playing rope tension drums with a lot of power. So you can actually go on YouTube and see people who fought in the Civil War playing the instruments that they were playing on, which is really incredible, you know. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you put in G A R Fife and Drum, G A R the Grand Army of the Republic, that's the Union Army. If you put in G A R Fife and Drum, you'll see this video of these fifers and these veteran fight, 90 year old. Uh, veterans playing the fife and drum. It's amazing. That's so they're, cool. They're, yeah, yeah, I know. So um, Smaller saw these these veterans playing. It was like, how, why, how they have so much power in their playing? So he would go, uh, at one point, he went to a veteran's hospital, and he was talking to these some of these veteran musicians, Civil War musicians, and they were showing him this technique. While well, we use, like, a whipping motion when we play. So he took that same, you know, he talked to several of them and he, he narrowed it down to this is the technique that they used, which is based on an upstroke and a downstroke. So you have it basically uh, three strokes. And my, my drum teacher was William Reamer, who was a national champion, four time national champion drummer who hmm. had played, wow. had uh, this is back. He was a national champion drummer back in the forties, played and, and, 
all the drum corps he played in were all national champions. He taught other national champion drummers. He was a drum judge. And he has spent time with all these, a, a lot of these famous drummers, learned the Connecticut style of drumming, which is still but probably the, the center for all rudimental drumming is in Connecticut. Um, that's where a, a lot of my friends are. We have a drum group here in, in, um, in the Philadelphia area called the Troublemakers, and it's made up of, of student, former students of Bill Reamer. Oh, and, cool. Well, we call ourselves the Troublemakers. That was what Bill Reamer called the six-stroke roll, actually. Oh, really? He was, wow. intri- he was intri- Bill Reamer was introducing a lot of these rudiments, um, the Radha McHugh, six-stroke roll, on, on, in the field of competition and drum and bugle corps way before the, the drum corps are that are playing them now. Like he was, he was a big innovator on the field of competition. So he's introducing a lot of these rudiments back in the forties and fifties. Now it's the six stroke roll. It's a part of drum set. It's part of sure. drum corps. So yeah, Reamer was teaching. So he, they didn't know what to call it. They didn't call it the six stroke roll. He called it the troublemakers because people were having trouble learning it. So he called troublemaker. <laughs> That's funny. So that we just we, yeah we just decided to call our group the troublemakers. But That's awesome. Yeah. So anyway, so um, so with all this, uh, so you have a, a lot of the the, the the rudimental drummers because a, the, a lot of the uh, the regiments were located in New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island. You have a lot of these, uh, a lot of the schools, actually some of the schools for military uh, um, musicians were, were in New York anyway. So um, what is one of the manuals that probably one of the most popular manuals that was published was uh, Bruce, it's called the Drummers, uh, Drummers and Fifers Guide by uh, George B. Bruce and Dan D. Emmett. And mm. yeah, so that their school was in New York and so they were they were teaching really teaching drummers and fifers how to play, because again there was this Lincoln talked about Grant President Grant talked about how we need to improve the, the the musicianship because as I mentioned before these young kids are coming in twelve years old ten years old you know thirteen fourteen and just thrown into learning to play the drum so we need to get the musicianship up to par so. They actually formed these schools where they would actually tr- start to train these drummers in the proper manner. Hmm. That's, and that's interesting because I always wonder about you kind of think like, how was this formalized? Like, and I, I've I've heard on some previous episodes where people would say, well, early on it was like, you know, your dad was a drummer and he taught you, or the neighbor was, or your grandpa was. But it's good to know that okay, so then this is when let's say by presidential decree, they were like, all right, we kind of sound a little sloppy here. Exactly. And this, yeah, let's tighten this up. Exactly. So it started with George Washington uh, and it it continued through to, to, through the civil war. There was this uh, desire to, you know, we need to start cleaning this up. We need the musicians up to step up. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So they formed these schools and then a lot of these manuals started appearing more manuals on drumming and fifing and bugles too. So, um, <clears throat> so, you know, we have the, uh, the, the Bruce and Emmett, their, their book, Dan Emmett, uh, was the, the gentleman who wrote Dixie, the tune Dixie. Oh yeah. So, yeah. um, there was actually a film about, uh, Dan D Emmett and, uh, Bing Crosby played. I don't know if you're familiar with Bing Crosby, but of course. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. So, Ben Crosby actually played Dan Emmett in this movie and it was called really? Dixie. It was called Dixie, but they don't show it. They, they pretty much abandoned it because Dan Emmett and historically was w- a toured around in blackface. So I, I was going to say, I knew where that was going. I was going to say everything ends up being kind of racist. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, unfortunately that's a sad part of our, as we know, a sad part of our American history. Uh, yeah. So, is, yeah. Is, so, and, and I can certainly understand why we wouldn't, we wouldn't want that to be shown. You know, we want, well, it's like a, the birth of a nation. Exactly. D.W. Yeah. Griffith film. Yeah. It's like it, it's a part of the history, but God, it's not. Yeah. No, part of the history. no, not. Uh, yeah. That's, it needs a, a, a it needs a d- adult supervision. <laughs> yes, or not, a, not not even to be seen because you don't want to even want that in the minds of people. No, you know? no, it's horrible. 
But um, now that we're at the Civil War and all this stuff, it's it's obviously I know the term rudiments and all that stuff had been formalized. What what does it look like compared to? Uh, again, as a guy who what didn't grow up, you you obviously are the the king of all this. So so. How did it look compared to today where we've got the set amount, what did you say, 26 official yeah, rudiments? right, right. How, how does it look compared to that where, like, it's very standardized? Uh, the Vic Firth of the day is printing a poster that has all the rudiments on it. And yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah. But, like, wh- where did they, you yeah, know, so, was it really formal? Um, well, it was formal in the sense of the military and, the so you know, yeah. from the Civil War, that's where the the the, uh, the 19th century, the 1800s, is where you start to where it's all starting to come together even more. It's in its infancy uh, in back in the you know what in Basel with the the town sure. crier drummer, um, and oh, also there's a famous painting going back to the Middle Ages. There's a famous painting called the Night Watch, and it's by Rembrandt, and you'll see in the in the lower um, the lower right hand corner of the painting, you'll see a drummer with a side drum that with a snare drum playing. So it's one of, it's a famous painting where you're, you know, one of the first early paintings where you can see a drummer playing with the drum off to the side, off to the left hand side mm. on the angle. So oh, yeah, I'm looking at yeah, it. I see yeah, it. The, yeah. That's right. The night watch. That's cool. Yeah. 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 So that's one of the earlier, so you can kind of get an idea of what the drum looked like in in, in comparison to a human. You know, they, they were pretty large drums back in the yeah. 1500s. Oh, my God, yeah. So, yeah. But, but then going forward, forward way, way yeah. in, so to the Civil War then, we're looking more we're looking more standardized. The, the military says these are our rudiments. These are what we play right. in those schools. So it's, right, it's, exactly. You know, there's manuals that you know, people can and, – and the average person – they were starting to publish some of these rudim- these uh, manuals and you could pick them up. And, and in fact, some of them were published right here in Philadelphia. Hmm. So, yeah. And, and so as, as musicians leave the military, they'll, they'll bring all that information with them. Those, those techniques and that knowledge with them, teaching other people. And then some of them would have those manuals with them. So they're teaching their students even, post a military as veterans they're teaching. So then what started to happen too, the other, then with these veteran groups, these veteran groups had the idea of putting together performing groups, bands. So they would put together these, these uh, like American Legion posts, veterans of foreign war posts would put together uh, marching, uh, marching music groups which became drum and bugle corps, fifes and, and drum corps, fife drum and bugle, and also some other organizations like churches, um, Boy Scout troops would put together these groups, and then they would start to compete. So, that makes still- sense. oh, so that's that's kind of when it started to get to where we get now, where there's you're not. We're not out in, you know, exactly. modern wars playing snares to signal people. Exactly. So exactly. So. Um, so cool. yeah, I know. So as you're as these manuals are becoming more available, and then people are are copying some of those rudiments, and then somebody like like Mahler, who was t- who taught Gene Krupa, spending time with the uh, spending time with Civil War veterans, he's documenting all this down, and he he releases his drum, um, the art of snare drumming. He releases his book. Which becomes real popular. Ludwig uh, Ludwig starts to publish it, and when you start getting these these drum companies like Leedy Leedy and Ludwig Ludwig and Ludwig, they were they were uh, publishing like the first Nard book. Well, Ludwig sponsored Nard, the National Association of Rudimental Drummers. They were the ones to sponsor, and they all the the the, the drummers that met for Nard all met, they were at an American Legion convention. So that's where they all met again, coming together the military, and and they were veterans. So you got the veterans, military people with all their knowledge of the rudiments, uh, getting together and then competing. They would have individual contests and they would have the drum and bugle competitions and fife drum and bugles, 
And then they also had fifes and drums uh, from, you know, in America from playing from the 1600s up until through the 1700s to, uh, and then into the 1800s. And then through today, we still have drum and bugle chord. We still have fife and drum chord. Sure, we have fife, yeah. drum, bugle. So that tradition is, has been maintained from the beginning of our nation through today. And, and again, the competition was a, a means for there to be incentive for people to get better and yeah. improve their musicianship. And, uh, I can, I've, I competed. I competed individually. I won a medal individually, um, with, with a buddy of mine, uh, Andy Reamer, who's, uh, was my teacher's, uh, son, who's now, he's Andy Reamer's now the principal percussionist with the Phil, uh, with the Pittsburgh Symphony. Huh, so yeah. he, he and I was our first time out competing. Uh, we competed as a duet up in Connecticut. We had to go to Connecticut to compete, but yeah, so we won a, a second place medal for our first time out, which, we were we were pretty pleased with so oh, yeah that's great know. that's super cool now let me ask you this when did when did nard or the national association of rudimental drummers form because again it's that it's that switching from this is military to like you said ludwig is sponsoring it and stuff i mean that's exactly just awesome yeah. when did that start that started in 1933 that was at the cool. um, at the the convention the american legion convention these drummers all happened to meet and so they decided, hey, we want to let's form an organization just for drummers. So they did that, and they um, so they met and they they decided to to they gave it the name, the National Association for Rudimental Drummers. And they thought, well, we need to establish a set of rudiments, a list of rudiments. How do we do that? So they finally. They got all these, the, all the manuals that they thought were the most important manuals. They got together, uh, and then took the best. So there was the, um, there was Ash. I mentioned Ashworth, Charles Stewart Ashworth. There was his yeah. manual. There was the Bruce and Emmett. We talked about that. There was uh, Muller's book. Then there was uh, uh, Gardner A. Strube. Um, that was adopted by the uh, U.S. Army in, in 1869. So it was a little later than the uh, Bruce and Emmett. Bru the Bruce and Emmett book came out in 1862, from 1862 to 65. And then the Strube uh, manual, which is probably one of the more influential uh, manuals, that came out in 60 1869. Then there was John Philip Sousa put out a manual. So you know the name John Philip Sousa. Of course. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so okay. the, yeah, so his manual came out. So they they used that. Um, that was in uh, the copyright for that was 1886. Um, so you had uh, you had Bruce and Emmett in 1860s, uh, Strube 1869 towards the end of the 60s, and you had John Philip Sousa 1886. Um, uh, Muller and then uh, Muller's was a uh, copyright in, in 1921 to 1929. Those, that's when it was first published. So that that's hmm. pretty early in the 1900s. But they yeah. they were taking all of these and kind yeah. of filtering it down to the best. How how many did they end up with? They ended point? up they ended up with a 26. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. yeah. Gotcha. So some of the like uh, uh, the Ashworth had uh, 14 rudiments. Um, let's see. Uh, then there was, uh, uh, Bruce and Emmett had 25 rudiments. Muller had, um, 26 rudiments listed. Um, Strube had 25. So he had pretty much, uh, you know, around the same numbers for rudiments listed in these. And most of them all had the same. There, there are only a few that like, uh, but Bruce and Emmett had, Flam accent number two. Mm. That wasn't, uh, they didn't list the flam accent number two in the 26 rudiment list. Um, they also, uh, John Phil Sousa also listed the four stroke rough. Now they didn't list the four stroke rough in the, uh, in the 26 Nard rudiments, but mm. most of them all had, they had the long roll, the five circle roll, seven, nine, 10, 11, uh, 13, 15 flam rough single drag they all had uh the single power diddle 
Now, some have the, they didn't list the triple paradiddle. They didn't, they decided not to list the triple paradiddle in the 26 rudiments. Uh, and there's one, there's one called the Lesson 25. Now, people are like, why are they called the Lesson 25? Well, it happened to be the, the 25th uh, um, Strube, uh, Gardner A. Strube, he, he referred to his, um, the rudiments as lessons. So it happened to be the 25th lesson rather than calling it the 25th rudiment. So right. it, because they didn't know how what to call it, they called it lesson 25 because it was the 25th rudiment in Strube's manual. Makes sense. It's a yeah. cool name. I mean, yeah. to have one that's lesson, like they all kind of have these cool little like uh, names to them. So. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and actually that, they, the mentioning the lesson 25, that to get at the that, that to get at the that. That same rhythm you find in the Arbo manual. That da 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 da. So, um, and some manuals there were there were a few manuals where um, the they didn't notate rudiments in the uh, that is during the this uh, the the Civil War period. There were rudiments that they just wrote down phonetically. What or they they would say a five, a three, and a two. Well, in, in for the lesson twenty-five in, in one of the early um, drum manuals, they called it a three and a two. A, well, and it was it was it started with a seven-stroke roll, so it would be a seven-stroke roll and then a lesson twenty-five. But they would say a seven, a three, and a two, and the, so it was the seven-stroke roll. The three would be the rough, and then the two or the the two remaining. So you got the they got that that. That to get it, to get that, that, that. Mm, so that yeah. what they call seven, a three, and a two. Gotcha. But so yeah, uh, so then they decide to call that the lesson twenty-five. So at that point, you had the uh, you had the twenty-six rudiments, and then later, when Nard was uh, having problems financially, they uh, Ludwig decided it was too much for them to, to they at the, the point they disbanded nard ludwig uh they were at about almost up to 10,000 members so imagine licking the stamps of of 10 of 9,000 letters or, or I can't. It was like, yeah sounds like a, a seinfeld episode it, yeah them. exactly <laughs> <laughs> so so Man. they decided okay it's too much. we don't want to put the money into that it's it's enough and at that point percussive art society was gaining momentum and they decided they were getting more into promoting marching, drumming, military drumming. So at that point, they decided to take over the promotion of, of rudiments. And they got together a group of, uh, of the top rudimental drummers. And they had a meeting, the Percussive Art Society, and decided, let's update the list from the 26 rudiments to 40. So, and they added some extra rudiments to the to the list. And actually, uh, believe it or not, towards the end of the um, the demise of Nard, before I started up again in two thousand eight, um, they there was talk about updating the list of the the Nard list. So even among mm. the Nard members, they were considering updating the list of the twenty six rudiments. So that was so the Percussive Arts Society took on the uh, the four. They 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 up the amount to 40 included some of these we were talking about swiss rudiments they included the swiss army triplet uh which is called the swiss army triplet because it's used a lot by the swiss army in their in their training that makes sense yeah so um, yeah is it still would you say that it's at this point april 27th 2020 when we're recording this right now is it pretty much locked in or is it an ever changing thing? It's a, uh, it's there. It's somewhat locked in, but it, it's still evolving. Uh, when I was in playing in drum corps back in uh, uh, in the seventies, I played in, in uh, several uh, championship corps, and um, I played alongside one drummer, um, Tom Hannum, who's was voted into the Hall of Fame, a uh, pretty popular uh, drum corps teacher and performer, and uh, he and I would just spend hours uh, shedding and and challenging each other with some of these uh, hybrid rudiments. We, would, we were kind of in the stages of developing some of these hybrid rudiments that are now a part of the, of, of the standard among drum corps drummers. So 
you say what what happened you know you, you you try you get a little bored playing okay 26 rudiments let's challenge ourselves let's try putting a diddle on this rudiment where just yeah. a single stroke would be or a flam and two and like a flam and two diddles yeah and yeah. uh yeah so i think that's why they're so i mean for so many years that's why they've been so beneficial to drummers is because you can take you can look at this one thing let's just say a parrot at all and do a million different things with it and i exactly. think that's why they have such a longevity and it, are so beneficial yeah exactly and and uh real quick i know we're, we're getting short on our time here but sure um uh, we're talking about the drummers um and i mentioned about that youtube video with the the gar fife and drum yeah. you can see the veteran well what was interesting I was talking to uh, Daniel Glass. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Daniel. Yeah, he's been on the show. Oh, okay. Yeah, a uh, great drummer and good friend of mine. And uh, we were talking, and uh, he was putting together his um, sensory project, and we were talking about the Civil War drummers. And I showed him this this video of the Civil War drummer veterans playing, and we noticed on the hoop of – the the snare the main the main guy that was playing the snare drum was a wood block, so it's like wow, like he's got a trap on his rope drum. So they were actually using traps in uh. the Civil War. So they weren't just playing; they were adding traps to get other sounds. And yeah. they, so the the wood block was being used in this video. They're at one point they're drumming and then they're playing on the rim while this guy's doing like a clogging, like tap dancing. So sure. they would they would use the wood block for an effect like to to sim like somebody's doing the clock step they would they would play along with them on the wood block. So Man. when you see the evolution of the drum set, the drum set is the military drum line. It's the snare drum, bass drum, cymbals. So exactly, that's yeah, and that's where that's where the drum set, the, the trap set came from. And the and double it, drumming with the, the bass drum, drumming, and, exactly, yeah. 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 So that Boy. all came from the military. And if you watch Baby Dodds, he films of Baby Dodds playing, even in his book, he, he has, he has a, uh, he put out um, a solo album. And on his album, uh, one of his, his uh, songs is called Rudiments. Hmm. So he played, you know, talked about the mama dad role. And so, yeah, yeah, these early drummers, even uh, the, the pioneers of the drum set were playing Rudiments because it came out of the military and they're playing the rudiments uh, as a part of that evolution. And, and yeah, yeah. So Man, I, I love that. Like, you know, from a drummer starting today up to like, let's say Steve Smith or whoever, just one of these great drummers, we're all practicing the same. We're all getting the same, uh, you know, great, Workout from using these rudiments. It's of just course, a, and, and, I love that. And, and probably one of the more popular drummers uh, who uh, promoter of rudiments is Steve Gad. Oh yeah, of and course, well, sure. Well, I, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, for a little while at one point, and yeah, he came out of drum corps, and uh, so and so he's playing. Um, I have a video. There's a very popular uh, uh, drum beating in Connecticut. And in the fife and drum circuit, it's um, it's called Crazy Army, and this was a, a, a kind of a standard. It, it, it was it's it comes from the Army Two Four. There was a standard drum part that what you'll find in the Bruce and Emmett book, and and they it ended up being they would call it the Army Two Four because it's kind of the standard Two Four drum beating mm -hmm. for a Two Four piece. So it was called the Army Two Four, and. So um, these guys uh, uh, took the 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 Army Two Four and beefed it up and syncopated it and developed this beating. They and they ended up calling it a Crazy Army. So instead of the mm -hmm. Army Two Four, they call it Crazy Army, and it started making the rounds in the drum in the drum core circuit. And being as Steve Gadd was in the drum core circuit, he picked up on. This this was one of the beatings that you had to kind of learn, not as a rite of passage, but yeah, it was one that, to learn it. Yeah, sure. So he now he, whenever he does a drum clinic, he always plays the Crazy Army. Oh, so cool. 
Yeah. I so I have a, I have a video from my video. I have a clip of of myself with a bass drummer playing Crazy Army on the rope drum. So that's awesome. You know, you can yeah. see the you know you can see the similarity. I mean, Steve Gadd plays the authentic Crazy Army, but he brings in his bass drum and funks up the bass drum part. You know. For yeah. the, but he's playing the he's playing the crazy army as is written. So he's a perfect example of using the rudiments and oh, exactly, uh, exactly. We, also, a Billy Cobham. Billy Cobham yes. played in drum corps. He's another drum corps guy. Man. Um. Uh. Yeah. Who's the other guy I'm thinking of too? That's a drum corps guy. Well, I mean, right at this point, there are a lot of guys played Tons in. Dr- so yeah, played in drum lines in high school and. Well, and, and I want to say, too, that I'm sure people are thinking about it, about, like, why aren't you getting to that? I, I'm working on an episode with, like, Scott Johnson to do, um, uh, like, I'm working on an episode that's more just the, the like, mar- marching and drum corps. So there's right. plenty of stuff that oh, yeah, we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I want to oh, save time oh, now. Tommy, Tommy Igo, that's the guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. He's, yeah, he, uh, he's a drum corps guy. He knows his stuff. Um, yeah. I want to save time Right now, as we wrap up, for you to tell people where they can find you if they want to become a member of NARD, all that good okay. stuff. How, how does all that work? Okay. So uh, to become a member of NARD, uh, just uh, go to our website. It's uh, NARD, N-A-R-D dot U-S uh, dot com. And cool. uh, yeah, and uh, also um, you can... Uh, we're on there, I have the oh, the twenty six rudiments are on there. You only need to learn the first thirteen for to. Uh, you have to take an exam with a somebody that's already an ARD member. Um, you can contact me at uh, mb mb drums at aol dot com if you send me uh, an email. You'd like to become a member, uh, I'll I'll uh, forward you to one of our members uh, in whatever state you're in, and if they're close enough, you can have an exam with them. If not, we can do a, a Zoom exam uh cool. through zoom yeah yeah and um also my video is available through be a pfeiffer.com b-e-a-f-i-f-e-r.com that's uh ed boyle site he's a pfeiffer but uh he, he also sells uh fret uh fret doctor which is uh he actually was originally supposed to be fife oil for to oil your fife but it ended up guitarists use it for their frets to keep their frets oiled. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Little yeah, side that, business there. Yeah. But he also sells all these drum manuals. So if you want to learn about, if you want to have a copy of all these great drum manuals, go to Ed, uh, be a Pfeiffer.com for all those drum manuals. Cool. And uh, yeah. And uh, I'm, I don't know if um, I can give a shout out to uh, some of, of my, endorse, my, as an endorser. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, Ev, uh, thanks to Evans, uh, Diodario. I don't know if you know this, but Diodario, um, the draw, the uh, guitar strings company, owns Evans. Yes, uh, they're definitely. now making um, they're now making face shields for I the know. medical. Community. I know it's so yeah. cool. Yeah. So thanks to to Diodario and Evans for uh, for that for supporting it. Also, thanks to Ludwig Drums, Vic Firth. Uh, drumsticks uh, and drummer service. Drummer services. Andrew Reamer. Uh, I mentioned my buddy. Um, he was the best man at my wedding. He's um, he's the principal percussionist at the Pittsburgh Symphony, and he took over his dad's uh, drum making business. So he makes they make rope drums and drumsticks, cool. handmade drumsticks. So that's important to keep that going. Oh yeah, and uh, and thanks to my wife uh, Connie and my son uh, my son Nick and my uh, daughter in law Grace. And uh, to my troublemaker drum corps colleagues, Lily Biotic Middlebrooks, Tom Middlebrooks, Steve Gillespie, Steve Kirkpatrick. Also to uh, my friends in Connecticut, champion drummers Jim Clark, Charlie Poole Jr., and Cliff Bowers, who are a big influence uh, in our uh, drumming down here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and U.S. Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps Sergeant Major Mark Riley, as well as to uh, Grammy Award-winning drummer Peter Erskine and his wife Mutsi uh, of their fuzzy music label. And I'd like to mention, too, that um, my al- my latest album, Battle Cry of Freedom, Fife and Drum Music of the Union Army and Anti-Slavery, uh, is available on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, uh, and Google Music. And it features the great fifer, Brittany Primavera, uh, the U.S. Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps and Army Band. Also, uh, um, uh, my hats off, and uh, uh, we just lost a few really good uh, 
great drummers, um, a rudimental drummer. Um, uh, we lost um, Jack Pratt. Uh, he was in the Hellcats, the West Point Hellcats, and taught the Hellcats, taught some drum corps. He just passed away, Jack Pratt, John Pratt. Also, George Carroll, who um, who uh, founded Williamsburg Fife and Drum Corps and the U.S. Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. Uh, George Carroll passed away. He was he was very uh, he helped me out a lot in putting together my uh, my DVD and uh, getting gathering all this information. Also, Alan a- Alan Abel from the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra just passed away um, just a couple of days ago. Um, he big influence on a lot of people. Uh, I had the fortune of playing with him a few times, and um, he was Andy Reamer's teacher and teacher for many classical percussion. But he's a great rudimental drummer too. So, but thank yeah, thanks wow. again. I, well, I want to thank you, Bart, for uh, this opportunity, and, my and Brandon Faulkner. Thank you so much. Absolutely. This has been great. I love learning things like this. And I hope people feel like this who who are listening out around the world. Like, you know, we, we don't get to hear this information very often um, from people like you. So it's an honor to have you on the show. So yeah, Mark well, Beecher, everyone. Well, That's B E E C H E R. People yeah. can find you online and all that stuff. And, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you again. So my pleasure. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. It was an honor. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.